Jesus is coming, but first. But first what? So here, uh, when we get to chapter 19 of the book of Revelation, we are fast approaching the end of this great book. Uh, the book of Revelation, remember this, is the only book in the Bible that promises a blessing to those who read, hear, and keep the words of this book. Remember how long ago we started the book of Revelation? Man, to think we are already here in chapter 19 and, and the things that we have covered. Man, I was hoping Jesus would be coming back literally by the time we got here, but, uh, but we're still here tonight. But chapters 1 through 3 of the book of Revelation is the church age. Uh, we've been in that church age for about 2,000 years. Chapters 4 through 18, uh, we, we're taken up into heaven, and then the great tribulation starts, and we are learning all of the things that are still coming on this planet, hence the things that we talked about just a few minutes ago with some of the current world uh, fragmenting events. Uh, we, we read about those types of things in chapters 4 are actually chapter 6 through 18 of the book of Revelation. So we finished that section, and now uh, the viewpoint shifts from this world and the tribulation period. The viewpoint is of heaven, and the viewpoint is also from heaven. And we're going to get there tonight. We're going to start at just the first 10 verses. But guess what happens next Sunday night? Jesus is coming again. Now, this is exciting, and, and then when we get there next week, we are coming with him. He's going to be on his white horse next week. This is awesome, and he is going to be coming and written on his robe and on his thigh are the names King of Kings and Lord of Lords, and we will be following with him, and he will rule and reign from Jerusalem for a thousand years as the millennial kingdom begins. So that is next Sunday night. However, right now, I think it's going to be pretty cool, too. So you ready? Let's read chapter 19 of the book of Revelation, verses 1 through 10. After these things, so Babylon has been judged. After these things, I heard a loud voice of a great multitude in heaven saying, Hallelujah, salvation and glory and honor and power belong to the Lord. For true and righteous are his judgments because he has judged the great harlot who corrupted the earth with her fornication, and he has avenged on her the blood of his servants shed by her. Again they said, Hallelujah, her smoke rises up forever and ever. And the twenty-four elders and the four living creatures fell down and worshipped God, who sat on the throne saying, Amen, Hallelujah. Then a voice came from the throne saying, Praise our God, all you his servants and those who fear him, both small and great. And I heard, as it were, the voice of a great multitude, as the sound of many waters, and as the sound of mighty thundering, saying, Hallelujah, for the Lord God omnipotent reigns. Let us be glad and rejoice, and give him glory, for the marriage of the Lamb has come, and his wife has made herself ready. And to her it was granted to be arrayed in fine linen, clean and bright, for the fine linen is the righteous acts of the saints. And then he said to me, Write, Blessed are those who are called to the marriage supper of the Lamb. And he said to me, These are the true saints of God. And I fell at his feet to worship him. But he said to me, uh, See that you don't do that. I am your fellow servant, verse 10, and of your brethren who have the testimony of Jesus. Worship God, for the testimony of Jesus is the spirit of prophecy. This is a fantastic set of ten verses. So you ready? Okay, let's go. First question, what are the people doing in the passage that we just read? This is real simple. They are praising the Lord. This is going to be the first time in the history of the world that the church has entered into a worship and praise service without arguing over the lyrics and without arguing over the style of the songs that they are singing. <laughs> it's finally going to happen. That alone is worth a hallelujah and an amen. In, in verse 1, John hears a loud voice of a great multitude in heaven. Uh, these people are shouting praise. The NIV says the roar of a great multitude. And notice what they are saying. Hallelujah with an H or hallelujah, as it says in my Bible, without the H, it's the same thing. Uh, what does it mean? It means praise be to our God or praise the Lord. I think this is so cool. 
Uh, everywhere I've gone in the world where they speak a different language, in any modern language, when you say hallelujah, everybody knows what it means. It means the same thing in every language that I, of any place I go to. I find this uh, so interesting and so comforting and, and so evidence of the sovereignty of God. When God split the Tower of Babel by, by confusing the languages and the people were scattered all across the world so they couldn't communicate anymore, guess what God kept in common? Hallelujah! So even with, even with the changing of the languages, uh, this is going to be the same everywhere you go for all generations. I think that is just so, so cool. Hallelujah! They are praising the Lord. Number two, uh, why are they praising the Lord? Look at verse 1 again. After these things, after the judgments, I heard a loud voice of the great multitude in heaven saying, Hallelujah, salvation and glory and honor and power belong to the Lord our God, for true and righteous are His judgments. So why are they praising the Lord? They or we are praising Him for salvation because salvation belongs to the Lord. They praise Him for His plan from before the world began to send God the Son to earth as a human being to die for the sins of humanity. This includes praise for Christ's sufferings on the cross, His death and His resurrection. It includes praise for sharing the salvation with humanity. We should praise Him now for the same reasons, especially salvation. The greatest thing about our existence is that Jesus Christ died for our sins so that anyone who would believe in him would not perish but have everlasting life. So we praise him for salvation because salvation belongs to the Lord. We praise him for glory because glory belongs to the Lord. We praise him for honor because honor belongs to the Lord. This is a matter of perfect honesty. It will be an honest response to seeing him as he is. We will recognize more fully than ever before that glory and honor belong to the Lord. I, uh, think of it like this. When we get to heaven, when we read these, if you know Christ, that is you and me in this. It's praising Him for salvation, praising Him for glory, praising Him for honor. We're going to know when we're standing there before the throne, praising Him that there's no more pain. We're going to know no more suffering, no more sorrow, no more fears, no more deaths, no more broken hearts, no more death, no more sadness, no more bullying, no more persecution or suffering or sickness or troubles, no more car payments, no more rent, no more taxes, no more politics. No more bad news. No more job. Apparently I hit a chord. No more job losses. Sins or temptations will forever be gone. That praise will be more incredible, infinitely more incredible than any praise we could ever experience that while we are here on this earth. And this praise applies not only there, it applies now. Right now when we praise the Lord. Think of this. We should give Him glory and honor in order to be authentic. They are His. They belong to Him, so we shouldn't hold back. What if I'm in a bad mood? Praise the Lord. Give Him glory and give Him honor. I talk to a lot of people that say, I don't feel like praising the Lord. That's one more reason why you should praise God. The Lord, praise is not psyching yourself up into a good state of mind. It is recognizing Him for who He is. Your mood has nothing to do with it except that worshiping Him often turns the gloom into glory. Uh, so some folks think that the music is the warm-up act. Other folks just look at the music and, and, and unfortunately, sometimes music in church is just, uh, it just turns into entertainment. It should not be either one of those. It shouldn't be about entertainment. And it's not just the warm-up act. When we enter into worship and praise, we will be praising Him then. But He's saying, you know what? You need to be praising Him now because it is about His salvation and His glory and His honor and we praise Him for power because power belongs to the Lord. I remember years ago, this is before I was saved, uh, somebody invited me to Harvest Christian Fellowship in Riverside. This goes 
back somewhere in the 1980s. I don't remember when, probably the early 1980s. And I'm sitting up in the balcony. I was all by myself. I was the only one in the balcony. Um, and, uh, and, and I went in there, and I'm sitting up there just trying to check it out. You know, what is this church thing about? And I remember Greg Laurie, he came up, and he pointed at me. I mean, I was the only one in the balcony, so I'm looking around. And, I was, and, and, and during some worship, I, was, I didn't get it, you know? I wasn't even a Christian. I'm just standing up there listening to the music. And he said, you better be praising him. <laughs> He's pointing at me. You better be praising him now because you're going to be praising him then. I'm thinking, what are you talking about? Anyway, this is what, apparently this is what he was talking about. <laughs> we, we, we praise him because power belongs to the Lord. He is the omnipotent one. He is the all-powerful one. In the Greek, this word for power, it comes from this Greek word dunamis, we get our word dynamite from it. Don't, don't you love that? Remember J.J. Uh, Walker? Dynamite. He's one of my favorites. I love J.J. Walker. It refers to strength and authority and control and ability. In the New Testament, dunamis carries the connotation of miraculous power and is sometimes referred to as marvelous power. This is the dunamis, marvelous power that we read about in Acts chapter 1, verse 8 as Jesus is getting ready to ascend into heaven. And he says this, Now you shall receive power, dunamis, dynamite, power, when the Holy Spirit has come upon you. And you shall be witnesses to me in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the end of the earth. If you are a Christian, the dunamis, power of the Holy Spirit, works in you. Don't depend on your flesh to give you victory over the flesh. Does that even make any sense? Yet that's what we as Christians often do. I've got to struggle with the flesh and I'm going to have victory over it. How? I'm going, to, I'm going to fight against it. Well, how? You need the power of the Holy Spirit. Don't depend upon your flesh to give you victory over the flesh. It makes more sense. Allow the dunamis power of God to work in and through you. And don't forget to praise him for it because power belongs to the Lord. What else? We praise him for honor because honor belongs to the Lord. For power because power belongs to the Lord. We praise him for justice because truth and righteousness belong to the Lord. Look at this again, verse 2. For true and righteous are his judgments. Because he has judged the great harlot who corrupted the earth with her fornication. He has avenged on her the blood of his servants shed by her. That's talking about uh, Christian martyrs. Again, they said, hallelujah, her smoke rises up forever and ever. Here, they slash we are praising him for his judgment against mystery Babylon. We're not used to this. It doesn't make sense to us. We're used to praising God for grace and mercy. They do that too. We'll do that too. But also, here the praise is because of his justice. They praise him for that, for his judgments. Hallelujah, hallelujah. Her smoke rises up forever and ever. It doesn't fit us right. But we will be praising him for this. And I'll tell you right now, I praise God for his justice even now this teaches us that evil exists and it will be judged praise god that it will be judged i think back to chapter 18 think with me when we were in chapter 18 and what happened there was judgment upon babylon chapter 17 there was judgment upon babylon do you remember why one of the reasons why was because this world had taken uh, the, the bodies and souls of men. Remember that? That speaks undoubtedly to sex slavery and, and people who are kidnapped and turned into slaves of all different sorts. And, and uh, little boys and little girls, uh, men and women who are abused and captured, taken from their parents. Sometimes I've talked with people that, are, that have come from really destitute countries. And uh, the parents have, have faithfully and hopefully sold their children thinking they were selling their children into good hands of a good person who will adopt them and that's not what's happened more times than not and the child ends up being 
sold to some sex pervert who's going to deliver that child over to sex slavery. And you look at that, God says, I'm going to judge the world for the selling because they, they've entered into the exchange of the bodies and souls of men. Folks, it's horrific, and I can't wait till God judges that. I hate that. It's grievous. But also he says this, he's going to judge this world for the, what, the martyrs, the, the Christians who are put to death, uh, simply because they are believers in the Lord Jesus Christ. Uh, and I think praise God for that. And that, so they're praising God. We are praising God for justice because truth and righteousness belong to the Lord. I, I, hallelujah. Come quickly, Lord Jesus. Uh, I think of this. This happened the other day um, in New Zealand. The mosque attack. Horrible, horrible thing to happen, right? I want you to think of this through with me. Um, I know this is going to bother some people online, but I'm going to tell you the truth. This mosque attack happened. It was a horrible thing that happened. Everything I've read says there's some white supremacist guy who went in there and shot up these people. There were a lot of people that were killed in the mosque attack. This says New Zealand threatens 10 years in prison for possessing mosque shooting video. And you look at that and you go, it's interesting. Now, I, I want you to think of this. All over um, the world, if you're a politician and you haven't condemned this, then you know, you're really bad. All right, uh, news media outlets and the whole bit. Listen, it's a horrible thing to happen. I get that. I condemn it. I think it's absolutely horrible. But I want you to understand something. Remember this? Okay, this is from uh, back <clears throat> with ISIS. These are men. It has nothing to do with the color of skin. I want you to note that. These are dark-skinned men. You look what's happening in Africa to Christian men and Christian women. Dark skin. It's nothing to do with race. This is because they are believers in the Lord Jesus Christ. So these men, this is a famous photo uh, captured by ISIS, they were believers in Jesus, and they lost their heads. They did not love their lives unto death. They realized they were living for the glory of God and the glory of the Lord Jesus Christ. I'm going to read you something, all right? I want you to keep this in mind, because we never hear about this on CNN. We never hear about it on, on MSNBC. We don't hear it about it in New York Times. We don't hear about it on Fox News either. So if you're thinking, well, Fox News, they'll re no, they don't even report it. But we do hear about the mosque shooting, which was a horrible thing. But understand this, what, this has been going on with Christians. And uh, on, on Saturday, uh, March 3rd, so a few weeks back, 2019, Gatestone published an article stating that 11 Christians are killed every day for their faith. The persecution of Christians would grow worse as his return drew near, is what Jesus said in John chapter 15. Jesus said this, Remember the word I said to you, a servant is not greater than his master. If they persecuted me, they will persecute you. And in Matthew 24, Jesus warned, they will deliver you up to tribulation and kill you, and you will be hated by all nations for my name's sake. In North Korea, teachers instruct small children to look for Bibles hidden in their parents' homes. If they find them, the children are rewarded, but they sometimes never see their parents again. In the Sudan... 13 Christians were arrested and tortured late last year for the crime of putting their faith in Christ. Sadly, this is not an unusual occurrence in a country that follows Sharia law. Sudan's human rights record is condemned by the whole world. It's an outcast among nations. Meanwhile, in China, the persecution continues daily in countless ways, whether it's through arrests or churches being burned down or Christians being killed and tortured. In Pakistan, Pakistani mobs routinely torture and kill Christians for the crime of being Christians. In, De in December, the Jerusalem Post ran an article headlined, Egypt's Silent Epidemic of Kidnapped Christian Girls. Uh, they wrote, the Christian women in Egypt face an epidemic of kidnapping, rape, beatings, and torture. Innumerable girls and women vanish forever. Similar atrocities are happening in Pakistan and several other nations where Muslims are in the majority and Christians are in a minority. And by the way, this increase in persecution against Christians is another sign of the days in which we live. But I want you to understand, the reason I read that to you, uh, what happened, this mosque being shot up in New Zealand, that's a really bad thing. Anything like that happens is awful. But it's interesting, that's all over the world's news. But you never hear about the 11 Christians a day that are being slaughtered and that is not anywhere near the number of, of uh, uh, Christians that are being 
taken into the sex trade business against their will, all because they're believers in the Lord Jesus Christ. Listen, I look at this and I say, praise God for his justice. Uh, he, we need Jesus to come. And I also say this, there are many people that are of the Muslim faith that are coming to faith in the Lord Jesus Christ at the same time. We don't hear about that either. But the fact that we don't even hear about Christians being persecuted in the news, but you hear another event that happens over here or happens over there is another sign of the evidence how much the world is against those who are believers in the Lord Jesus Christ. But praise God for his justice. Look at verse 4. And the 24 elders and the four living creatures fell down and worshipped God who sat on the throne saying amen and hallelujah. Next question, who are the 24 elders? Uh, uh, we went into detail this way back uh, uh, in chapter 4 of the book of Revelation. So I'm not going to go into all of those details. You can get those details online uh, at Hope for Our Times or also on 412 Church website. You can get them, they're, they're free. You can access the notes there. But here's what we can know and what blesses us. Here, these 24 elders simply say, Amen and Hallelujah. They are adding their voices to the others. Something big is happening. Jesus is about to return to earth. And then even more voices are added. Verse 5, Then a voice came from the throne saying, Praise our God, all you his servants, <coughs> and those who fear him, both small and great. And I heard as it were the voice of a great multitude, as the sound of many waters, and as the sound of mighty thundering, say, Hallelujah for the Lord God omnipotent reigns. The first voice says, praise our God. Then John hears the voice of a great multitude. He describes it as a sound of many waters and as the sound of mighty thunderings. There's the power on this praise. And they are saying the words that Handel uh, says it, and, and Handel's uh, Messiah. Hallelujah for the Lord God omnipotent Rains. When I was up here before, uh, before you got here tonight and the worship team was practicing, I said, hey, uh, you have one song tonight that fits really well with this, but you could up it a little bit more. Is there any way you can get a big uh, orchestra in here right now and quickly learn Handel's Young Messiah and start this? Because man, would it, fit, <laughs> would, it, would it fit? I wish I could sing it, but that would be destructive. In heaven... In heaven, I will be able to sing it. In heaven, we'll be able to sing it. Verse 7 and 8. Let us be glad and rejoice and give him glory, for the marriage of the Lamb has come, and his wife has made herself ready. And to her it was granted to be arrayed in fine linen, clean and bright, for the fine linen is the righteous acts of the saints. Next question, uh, number 4. What is the marriage of the Lamb? So the first thing we note is this. The lamb is the Lord Jesus Christ, and his bride is the church. The New Testament teaches that. Excuse me just a second. I'm running out of something. I think I'm talking too loud or something. I don't know what's going on. We really. <coughs> so, talked about this this morning. If you were here at, church, at this church this morning, uh, if not, it, it, uh, it, that's all right, because it fits right here so well. This morning I talked about heaven and uh, the, the bride and groom relationship in Jewish history of past, as, and that's what's going on here. I want you to think of this. We were thrust into the marriage of the Lamb. Think of this. Go back about 2,000 years to the time of Christ, and you have a, you have a young lady and a young man that are going to get married to each other, and uh, they, they've fallen in love. You know, they've uh, the dowry has been paid, and it may have been a set-up relationship, but they're getting married, and it comes a point in time when there's the betrothal, and the betrothal of the marriage, of the wedding that's coming, the marriage that's coming for a Jewish couple 2,000 years ago, uh, it was like our engagement, but it was a lot more binding. It was a lot stronger. The uh, betrothal period, um, even though you weren't officially married yet, the consummation of the marriage hasn't happened yet. Uh, still, to get out of the, the marriage that's coming during the betrothal period, you still had to file for divorce. That's why Mary and Joseph, in the Gospel of Luke, they're betrothed to one another. And uh, at the same time, 
uh, they're not yet officially married, but Joseph, to put Mary away, he was going to have to seek a divorce. So there's a contract. It's a binding contract. So the betrothal period is there. So during the betrothal period, this is what would happen. The young man, he'd go to his father's house. And at his father's house, he begins to add on a room or space for his bride to be able to come and dwell there with him at his father's house. And, and when the house was ready, when the place was ready, where the groom had added on to his father's house, the father would go tell his son, okay, the place is ready, go get your bride. And then the groom would take with him the groom's men. And they would go to the village of where the bride-to-be lived, the one he was betrothed to, the one he had this covenant, the one he had this contract with. And they'd be coming with all of the music. And the bride wouldn't know when that time was going to come. But she just had to be ready. Hence the parable of the ten virgins, the, wise, the five wise and the five foolish. You better be ready because Jesus is coming. Right? You see the imagery. So the bride is there at her house. And she didn't know when the groom was coming. But when she heard the music, she knew, Woo! Man! My man is here! And she would go out the door. And she'd hear the music. And, and the groom would take his bride. He would pick her up. And man, he would take her to his father's house. Hence the imagery, right? We are waiting for that trumpet to sound. When Jesus says, come up here, we go out through the door of this world and we are going into heaven. This also helps us to understand these words of Jesus in John chapter 14 where he said, in my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you, but I go and prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you to myself that where I am, you may be also. We are going to the marriage and the marriage supper of the Lamb. And then also notice here, we have the bridal gown. Uh, the voice of the multitude says in verse 7, his wife has made herself ready. He, she's, she's, she's ready. Speaking of this, talking about you and I. We've made ourselves ready to meet the Lord. We're waiting. Listen, you guys come on Sunday nights. People watching videos on, on messages like this. We are all making ourselves ready. We're going, Lord Jesus, come quickly. So we get into this kind of Bible study because we know what it's about. We're saying, oh Lord, please hurry. Glory and honor belong to you. Justice belongs to you. Truth belongs to you. So we are making ourselves ready. But John adds to this, and to her it was granted to be arrayed in fine linen and bright, and the fine linen is the righteous acts of the saints. Interesting. We are not saved by our righteous acts, right? We are saved by grace. Ephesians chapter 2, verses 8 and 9 tells us we are saved by grace through faith. It is the gift of God, not through our own works, lest anyone should boast it's not by the works we do that we get into heaven but because we are saved we do the righteous acts we help out people we minister we care we visit people in hospitals we pray for them we we see somebody that's destitute we work with them and we minister we visit people in prisons these are the things that we do the righteous acts don't save us but the righteous acts are evidence that we are saved and we are followers of Christ. Amen? Next question. How are the righteous acts determined? Glad you asked. I'll show you. Ready? For no other foundation can anyone lay than that which is laid, which is Jesus Christ. Amen. Now, if anyone builds on this foundation with gold, silver, precious stones, wood, hay, or straw, each one's work will become clear in this illustration here the gold the silver and the precious stones are speaking of righteous things in christ the wood hay and stubble not so straw not so much they're the things that are going to be burnt up that's what's going on here um, for the day will declare it because it will be revealed by fire and the fire will test each one's work of what sort it is if anyone's work which he has built on it endures he will receive a reward keep that in mind you'll receive a reward I don't know about you, I want to get a reward when I get to heaven. 
I, I want to make sure if, I, if I'm going to live for the Lord, I want to do this thing as right as I can. I am not perfect, but man, the Lord help me to stay on course. If anyone's work is burned, he will suffer loss, but he himself will be saved, yet so as through the fire. If you're a Christian, the only foundation you can build on is the Lord Jesus Christ. But what we build with on that foundation is the thing that's going to determine uh, what, whether or not our acts are righteous. Look at this. 2 Corinthians chapter 5 says, For we all must appear before the judgment seat of Christ, that each one may receive the things done in the body according to what he has done, whether good or bad. At this judgment seat, our works are going to be tested as if by fire. Gold, silver, precious stones, or wood, hay, straw, right? Which one's going to burn up? The wood, the hay, and the straw, right? So um, this is not the great white throne judgment to be judged for our sins and be cast into the lake of fire. This judgment, the Bema Seat judgment, is judging us as believers in Christ, judging our works. Does that make sense? We get to heaven because of the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, but our works are going to be judged. Our motives are going to be judged. Uh, for example, works done with selfish motivations, even if they had good results, will burn away like stubble in, the, uh, in wildfire. But works done with right motives for the Lord Jesus Christ, even if you had no fruitful results that you could see, you're going to get a reward for that. Jeremiah the prophet in the Old Testament he was faithful to his calling, and not one person got saved through his preaching. You know that? But he was faithful. He's got a reward in heaven. And, and, and we judge ourselves based upon the, the fruit that we see, and we think, well, uh, I've got this many people listening to me, therefore. No, you might have that many people listening to you, and that's going to be used against you because your motives were all wrong. Uh, what's done for Christ is a thing that's going to, lo uh, going to last. Um, well, by the way, keep this in mind. They say you can't take it with you when you go, right? I believe it. You don't see a hearse uh, uh, um, pulling a U-Haul uh, uh, and, and putting it into the grave as this person's going to take the U-Haul with them to heaven. It's not going to work, right? However, you can send it ahead. Uh, let me explain. Listen, you can actually invest in heaven. Did you know that? You can invest in heaven with your good works. You can invest in heaven with your attitude uh, by loving others, you invest in heaven. By living in faith, trusting God. A person like Jeremiah lived by faith. God told him, Jeremiah, you're going to do this. I don't see anybody coming to my church. You're going to be faithful anyways. I don't see anybody coming. They aren't listening to my prophecies, Lord. And he was faithful, right? Uh, we're gonna be, we, can, we can store our treasure in heaven through be, being it, it, with our motives. We can serve at a soup kitchen next to somebody else and you can have pure motives, glorifying God, or you can be all about me. Well, I hope they're getting pictures of me serving at the soup. Uh, let, let, let me get my selfie so I can show the world how awesome I am. Listen, you start looking at, at you, you look at Instagram and Facebook long enough, you're going to think everybody in the world is perfect. They all, they all got pictures. They, it's photo ops for good works. You see that stuff? You know, listen, whatever people want to do, but God is going to judge our motives. Um, you can store your treasure in heaven with your money. Uh, you, listen, you ain't taking that with you when you go, right? It, your, your dollar bills aren't going to be any good in heaven. Pesos aren't going to be any good in heaven. Shekels aren't going to be a good, any, any good in heaven. The euro is not going to be any good in heaven. However, if you... You can spend your money wisely here in the sense of investing in the kingdom of God and the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. And let me tell you, the retirement plan in heaven is going to be far greater than any retirement plan that you can have here on this earth. And uh, sometimes we can get discouraged and say, Lord, um, I've been tithing and I don't really get it. Think of it this way. Every penny you are putting towards the kingdom of God and the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ, that is accumulating in heaven in a retirement account that is outrageous. And you start, I mean, you, you think, man, Lord, this, that is so cool. But uh, I look at this, uh, at the judgment seat of Christ, what remains of our works will be beautiful, clean, 
and pure, collectively the works of the church that remain will serve as the bridal gown at the, at the wedding supper of the Lamb. This is what John said again in verse 8. And to her it was granted to be arrayed in fine linen, bright and clean, for the fine linen is the righteous acts of the saints. I, I do not want to be in heaven. And you all are looking at me, and I've got these funky clothes on, right? And you're going, oh, they, look at him. He's a mess at the marriage supper of the Lamb. You know what that means? My acts weren't so righteous. I made it into heaven by grace. Listen, I, you, you want to get there and go, wow, man, look at how they are dressed. They are looking good. And it kind of gives you a, a picture of how things are developing there. I don't know exactly how it's going to work, but somehow it's going to work out like that. Isn't that interesting? Our righteous acts are, how, are, are our dress. It's, it's, our, it's our wedding gown. That's a trip. Man. I think this is the last question. It is. What is prophecy really about? Look at this. You ready? Verse 9 and 10 again. Then he said to me, Right, blessed are those who are called to the marriage supper of the Lamb. And he said to me, These are the true sayings of God. And I fell at his feet to worship him. But he said to me, See that you do not do that. I'm a fellow servant. This is an angel talking to John. And John goes to worship the angel. The angel said, Get up! What's the matter with you? I ain't Jesus. I'm pointing you to Jesus. That's what's happening here. See that you don't do that. I'm your fellow servant. And of your brethren who have the testimony of Jesus, worship God, exclamation mark. Look at this. For the testimony of Jesus is the spirit of prophecy. Prophecy is all about Jesus. It is the revelation of him. In fact, chapter 1, verse 1, the book of Revelation says, the revelation of Jesus Christ. That means the revealing, the unveiling of the Lord Jesus Christ. Why do I teach Bible prophecy? Uh, for a few different reasons, but the, one, the number one reason is this, is because this is all about Jesus. Jesus is the reason. And I've shared this with you all before. People say to me, probably said to you, um, why do you study Bible prophecy? Say to me, why do you teach Bible prophecy? Uh, what you really need to do is just skip all the prophecy stuff and just talk about Jesus. What we need is more of Jesus. Well, have you read chapter 19, verse 10? Uh, Bible prophecy is the testimony of Jesus. It is all about Jesus. Listen, over a quarter of the Bible is Bible prophecy. When you say, I need more of Jesus, but I don't want Bible prophecy, what you're admitting is, I got too much Jesus. You think you're getting more Jesus. You're getting less. Would you go down to the, to the tire dealer down on Florida Avenue? And you go down to the tire dealer. You're saying, I need four new tires. And then he tells you, he says, well, you know, actually, I'm just going to give you three wheels. We'll leave the fourth one off. And you say, and he goes, I'm giving you more of what you're actually needing. What would you think? No, you're not. You're giving me less. And then he gives you three wheels, and you drive down Florida Avenue, and you got sparks coming from the rim on your, right, on the, on your car. You think, well, that's stupid. Well, this is what the Bible teaches. Why would you say I need more of Jesus, but you cut out a quarter of Jesus, and then, and then you think you're getting more? Uh, that's a deception of the devil. Uh, Bible prophecy is the testimony of Jesus. Think of this. Prophecy honors the Lord by telling us who he is. I'm going to go back to this Old Testament one as we wrap up. Isaiah chapter 9. Think of this prophecy, right? We hear it every year at Christmas. For unto us a child is born. Unto us a son is given. And the government will be upon his shoulder. And his name shall be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. Of the increase of his government and peace, there will be no end. <clears throat> upon the throne of David and over his kingdom, to order it and establish it with judgment and justice. There it is again. Jesus is coming, and we praise him for his justice. From that time forward, even forever, the zeal of the Lord of hosts will perform this. This is prophecy, and this is about Jesus. When Jesus presented himself, when he came the first time, he presented himself to the religious rulers he laid out his credentials by appealing to bible prophecy 
Uh, in the same way today, we show the validity of his claims by pointing to Bible prophecy fulfilled in his life, and we also validate his claims by pointing to prophecies that, that, excuse me, that describe the times in which we live. Prophecy proves Jesus. It proves him to believers who need to have their faith strengthened, but it also proves to those who have never before believed. There are a lot of reasons to study Bible prophecy, but the best reason is this. Prophecy glorifies Jesus, prophecy testifies Jesus, and the testimony of Jesus is the spirit of prophecy. Amen? Lord, we thank you for your word. We thank you for your help and your strength. And I ask that you would use this to strengthen everybody in here tonight as we look at Bible prophecy every week and wonder why we do it sometimes. You are coming, but ultimately it is for your glory. Hallelujah. And everybody that is watching online, Lord, strengthen them as we press forward together until Jesus comes. For the testimony of Jesus is the spirit of prophecy. It's in your name we pray, Lord. Amen. Amen.